Raz, dva, tři, raz, dva, tři, dobrý večer. Tak já doufám, že všichni už na, nalezli svá místa, když tak ještě nahoře na galerii je dostatek prostoru. Jsme milé potěšení až překvapení hojnou účastí, tak doufám, že vás nesklameme. Já se jmenuji Josef Pazderka, jsem zpravodajem České televize. Byl jsem požádán, abych tuto, tuto debatu moderoval, čehož se rád zhostím. Na začátek, ještě než vám řeknu další detaily toho, co vás čeká, bych taky rád tady přivítal a poprosil paní děkanku Filozofické fakulty, aby vás krátce pozdravila. OK, nad technikou jsem zvítězila. Dobrý večer, kolegové, vzácní hosté, dámy a pánové, přátelé Filozofické fakulty. Je pro mě nesmírně velikou ctí, že tady teď stojím a můžu vás všechny přivítat. Jednak bych chtěla vůbec poděkovat kolegům z Člověka v tísni, že tohleto setkání zorganizovali. A za sebe a za fakultu bych hrozně ráda řekla, že tohleto je téma, které je enormně důležité i pro nás, jako pro fakultu, jednak proto, že musíme být součástí té veřejné obecné, obecné diskuse a debaty a tohle to je jedna z příležitostí a, a také důkazem, že tedy jsme považováni za partnera, který se k tomu hodí. Myslím si, že všichni souhlasíme, že je strašně důležité, abychom nějak přispívali k inteligentní a, 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 k, a vůbec informované debatě teda o tématu, které nás všechny zajímá, které je nesmírně důležité, jak už jsem říkala. Takže jenom ještě jednou všechny vás tu vítám, děkuji, že jste přišli, děkuji organizátorům, že mě k tomu přizvali a přeji vám tedy takový intelektuální zážitek, jaký očekáváte. Děkuji vám. Tak a teď, co bude následovat? Organizátoři z Člověka v tísni, kterým, kterým touto cestou ještě jednou moc děkuju za zorganizování celé akce, pro vás teď připravili zhruba 40-minutový dokumentární film Svět podle Russia Today, který by měl nastínit vlastně to, o co konkrétně se jedná a dát vám nějakou konkrétnější představu o tom, čemu čelíme a čemu by se podle názoru mnohých zdravá společnost měla umět bránit. A poté bychom přivítali pána s tímto jménem, Pítr Pomerancev, který dorazí v průběhu toho promítání. Podle některých informací je skutečně už v Praze, nerozdvojil se. Jeho předchozí přednáška na občanském institutu neznamená, že nebude tady, jak někteří předpokládali, takže se nebojte. Pítr Pomerancev je, je britský novinář ruského původu, který deset let pracoval v řadě ruských televizí. Tu svoji zkušenost popsal v nedávné knize Nothing is true, everything is possible, která popisuje svět ruské propagandy a vůbec ruských televizí zevnitř. Myslím si, že je výborným také předstupněm pro informovanou a další debatu. Jenom chci připomenout, že právě tuto knihu vydá v českém překladu v dohledné době nakladatelství do kořán, takže vřele doporučuji jako, jako diskuzi. Po těch 40 minutách toho dokumentu by následovala moderovaná diskuze, kterou bych rád otevřel krátkým vstupem právě Pítra Pomeranceva, aby řekl zhruba 10-15 minut to, co on k tomu tématu má aktuálního a pak bychom rádi maximálně otevřeli ten prostor vašim dotazům. Byl bych velice rád a dopředu prosím, aby ta debata byla co možná nejméně agresivní, abychom se si naslouchali. Tím účelem této debaty rozhodně není přijít se, se potvrdit v jednom jediném názoru a zhodnout se na tom, jak všichni na východě jsou špatní a my skvělí. Myslím si, že jde spíš o to nastínit reálné informované kontury toho, co se děje kolem nás a jak, by se, jak bychom se v tom měli orientovat. Tolik z mé strany, myslím, že je čas pustit ten dokument. Tak tolik film Svět podle Russia Today. Já bych poprosil Pítra Pomeranceva, aby zaujal místo. Znovu opakuji, máme čas zhruba do 
20 hodin. Teď, by, teď bych Pítra rád poprosil o nějaký 10-15 minut úvodního slova. Hmm. Po těch 10-15 minutách bychom otevřeli otázkami nějakou naši diskuzi. Pro zrychlení a pro zjednodušení té diskuze jsme se nakonec domluvili, že by Pítr tedy samozřejmě mluvil anglicky, bylo to překládáno, nicméně ta diskuze samotná by běžela v češtině, Pítrovi odpovědi by byly tlumočeny, ale my bychom diskutovali v češtině, abychom se všichni netvářili, že jsme Britové z Oxfordu. Yes. <laughs> ano. Um, so you, 15 minutes to speak. Is there anything in particular you want me to speak about? Because I can talk about myself. I, mean, um, so, I would, if I may, yeah. I would ask you to introduce yourself a bit. Yes. Because I did say something, but not enough. And uh, then we saw the story of... Uh, the world according to Russia today? Just yeah, now? Yeah, I realize the, that. The, the documentary, so if you can follow in that line, any particular thing that you, okay. you think uh, might be interesting for the Czech, Czech audience, then go ahead. Okay, so, I'm f this is the most amount of people that I've, I've talked to, so this is very exciting. So, um, so, listen, I'm not a media analyst. Uh, probably some of you are studying media, so you probably know much more than I do about how to uh, quantify, uh, qualify and analyze the effects of propaganda. Um, I was originally a television producer and I worked in Moscow for almost nine years um, making films about Russia for Western broadcasters, the BBC, Discovery, all these vicious arms of, of the Pentagon's uh, propaganda machine. Uh, and, um, uh, and then I went to film school in Russia uh, and then I ended up working with Russian entertainment channels. This was between 2006-2010. It was already seen as experimental morally to work with news channels then. So I worked with the pure entertainment channels and I did something much more sinful. I helped bring reality shows to Russia and destroyed the culture of Dostoevsky and brought it down to the level of Survivor and Big Brother. Um, but, but it gave me an experience to write a book about my time there. Uh, and the books, it's, done, it's called Nothing is True and Everything is Possible, which is sort of my time in Russia, uh, working inside this very new type of authoritarianism um, and all the people I met there. Um, and that is going to be translated into Czech and it's going to be out for Christmas so maybe I can come back and talk about me but for the moment we'll have to talk about something much more boring and that's information war um, so listen I have been I was asked actually before this documentary was made I was asked to look at the subjects of information war by magazines by uh, a couple of think tanks and I that's all I want to talk about today I have 13 minutes, yeah? So I'm just going to deconstruct this term information war a little bit. Um, when I first heard the term information war, I imagined a debate. You know, here's a bunch of propagandists here, and here's a bunch of propagandists here, and they shout at each other, like during an election debate. Uh, and they try to scream each other down. I'm right, no, you're right. And information war, you know, we talk about it all the time, you know, everything's information war. And then I started to actually read what the Russian military and intelligence services understand by information war. And it has nothing to do with what I as a journalist or TV producer uh, thought information war meant. They meant something very, very specific. They meant the use of information uh, for military and weaponized purposes. I'll give you some quotes from a handbook on information war which is given to students of Russian intelligence, civil service and military academies. So this is a quote. Am I going too fast for the translator? 
Is it okay? Okay. So I'm quoting. This is not me talking. This is from a handbook given to Russian students. Information war. A person can't react to this action. It is like an invisible radiation. The action can be disguised in a benevolent form, which purely biologically a person can't respond to. The main danger of information war is that you can't see the damaging results. The population doesn't even feel it is being acted upon, so the state doesn't switch on its self-defense mechanisms. So suddenly, you know, I thought it would be about debates, and suddenly it's about invisible radiation. It's like something out of Lovecraft. Do you know who Lovecraft is? Stanislav Lem. You know, science fiction. Information war is the quote. Information war looks like peaceful war. In normal war, Victory is a case of yes or no. In info war, it can be partial. Several rivals can fight over a certain theme or topic within a person's consciousness. Information war gets rid of the terms friend, enemy. You can be working with someone, but be their information enemy. So in this analysis, of course, it is Russia who is under attack with this invisible radiation through the BBC, NGOs, um, Hollywood. All these are banded against Russia uh, in a conspiratorial plan to bring Russia to its knees, and therefore Russia has to respond. So Russian military thinking always starts off, we're under attack, therefore we need to attack. You know, you know, Leninist thinking was the same, we're under attack, therefore we have to take Prague. You know, it always couches it. So they're talking about what they think is happening to them, therefore they have to do it themselves. And so going further into the Russian idea of information war, their idea is that in the wars of the future, you can break a country without touching it. So unlike Ukraine, which is actually, you know, putting troops in there, hybrid war, they're actually talking about a war of the future with no troop movements, and that you can break a country by influencing, and this is their words, its psychosphere. You laugh, but, so what does this mean practically? It all sounds like a bunch of science fiction rubbish. So I don't know, last week, I don't know if you read the New York Times, because you should. Um, there was a great piece in the New York Times magazine by Andrew Chen when called The Agency, which looked at the actions of a Russian troll agency based near St. Petersburg. And they had done these bizarre disinformation attacks on Louisiana and Alabama. Uh, bizarre things, which sound like absolutely stupid, like uh, they're trying to sort of, uh, do an internet troll rush, so non-stop comments on the internet, as if there was an ISIS attack in Louisiana, and then an Ebola outbreak in Alabama. Um, the idea seems to be, straight out of this idea, that you can sort of plant panic, uh, sow confusion, uh, at a specific time. I mean, I talked to a few defense analysts, I'm like, what on earth are they playing at? This is ridiculous. They had no effect. I mean, there was no nervous breakdown in Louisiana, obviously. But the defense guys, look, imagine this sort of situation. Uh, there's a cyber attack on JFK airport, uh, a media attack sowing panic uh, in New York, thinking there's an Ebola attack. Meanwhile, you know, the Russians take Mariupol. So it's part of a sort of a, a grander design uh, of, of, of some sort of attack. Maybe, but that's, that, could be what, why, that could be the thinking that they're applying. I mean, a much clearer example, and I think the closest we have to a real active example, is Estonia in 2004, when the Estonians, to my mind, rather naively, tried to move a Red Army statue from the center of town to a military ceremony. Um, there was a cyber attack on Estonia. At the same time, there was rioting in the center of Tallinn by groups who were in daily contact with the Russian embassy, uh, and there was a massive media attack, uh, in, in mainly in Russian language media, saying stories like, the Estonians have killed loads of Russians, the Estonian secret services are fascists, and so on and so forth. And the idea was to sort of paralyze Estonia for a few days. Um, you know, the cyber attack meant that the, um, uh, that the banks couldn't work, the newspapers went down, the media attack meant there was panic in the country, plus there was rioting. So it seemed to be sort of a message being sent to Estonia, you know, you're in the EU, you're in NATO, but we can still get to you without ever having to invade. Look, we can have a conversation about whether the sort of Russian military's idea of information war will work, or whether it's like one of these crazy Russian ideas, but they take it very seriously. Um, and I think we have to understand Russia today as part of that. Um, 
they talk about it openly. So Kisilov, who's the head of Rasiya Sivodnya, talks about it quite openly. He says, I am a warrior in information war. This is what I do. Margarita Simonyan talks about it openly. She says, we're under information war attack. We have to attack ourselves. They're not talking about themselves as journalists. They're quite openly talking about themselves as a different category of activity. So that's information war. I've got seven more minutes. Um, and it's a military intelligence thinking that goes into it, very far away to something that I'm used to. At the same time, a part of this, I wouldn't even call it information war, I'd call it weaponized information. Yeah? Part of this is something else which is much closer to my heart and my profession, which is the war on information. Yeah? Which is the idea that you can trash the information space with disinformation in order to plant confusion, relativism, morally break the enemy. So that's a very small subpart of a much bigger information uh, war idea, which includes cyber attacks, sort of economic attacks, and so forth. And that's something much closer to journalism. And I don't know how many of you study journalism or will be connected to it. I think that's something which concerns journalists, because I think the other weaponized information is really the business of, you know, secret services, the military, to, and, and the courts to deal with, and police. But this is something as journalists I think we can talk about. So what, what do we mean by the war on information? I think it's worth looking at the history of not just Russian, but um, sort of uh, uh, false information operations throughout history. So let's take the Americans. One of the mechanisms to start the original Iraq war, not 2003, the one in the 1990s, was a classic bit of false information by the Hill and Nodleton PR company, which fabricated a story about Kuwaiti children were being murdered by Iraqi soldiers. It was pure fabrication. And they sold this to the US Congress as one of the reasons to go to war. But they were trying to convince Congress it was real. The Soviets were up to, up to it non-stop. There was a Department of Active Measures in Soviet times. And the, the part of the Department of Active Measures, their job was to spread uh, false stories inside Western media. So a classic one was the CIA designed the AIDS virus in order to um, kill off the population of Africa and their own Afri African American population. It was a way to sow discontent um, you know, in the third world against America and among uh, African Americans inside America. So when the KGB did this story, they spent years on it. They found some scientist in Holland, I think, I can't remember where, to concoct this theory. They then placed it in a South African newspaper, waited a year for the American press to pick it up. It was, they put a lot of effort in making false information feel real. What's the difference when Russia Today do it? Russia Today had a story which was almost a quote. Ebola is a plan by the Pentagon to eliminate Africa. It's almost like a postmodernist wink, you know. It's like, remember the AIDS story? Now we're doing it with Ebola. The difference is they don't try to make it look real. They put it on a conspiracist website uh, in the US, then RT reports on it like a serious story and puts it out there. And you can myth bust all you like, that's not the point. The point is just to put it out there and sow confusion. The same thing, MH17 was a very simple example, but really they're doing this non-stop. Um, you know, very simply, uh, the idea that uh, there were no, no Russian soldiers in Crimea. They didn't need anyone to believe it. They just need to push out enough of this to confuse the space uh, while uh, you know, the operation was carried out. So that's not so much information war, that's a war on information. But why is it effective? Why is, you know, pushing out ridiculous stories about Ebola even potentially effective? And this is where it gets, for me, very, very much more disturbing. Because however much of a threat Russia is, it is, in the, politics, in the context of geopolitics, a troll. Um, you know, it is not of the importance of China or, or any other the, the, the true great powers at the moment. But they are surfing a wave, and we're seeing an attack on information happen throughout the world. Um, you know, the easiest to point is inside America itself. We saw the rise of Fox News, which really, I mean, they, they're working in a very different context. They're working within the context of elections inside America. But as Stephen Colbert famously said, uh, you know, 
an abandonment of the idea of fact, in, uh, and instead that you have truthiness. You know, I feel it's true, therefore it's okay. And also doing these disinformation attacks. Obama is a Muslim. Obama is a, is a, uh, wasn't born in the US, knowing perfectly well their disinformation. So a real use of news, no, for, of the freedom of information for disinformation. But it's very easy to focus on America. They're a very easy target. It's happening throughout the world. The Chinese have a doctrine of uh, they call the three warfares, which is a way of changing the reality uh, of uh, the current maps in Southeast Asia. So they want the border moved so they get much more of the sea and push out the Philippines and Japan. Their news agencies spit out uh, sort of disinformation after disinformation, including sort of false maps which move the border further and further and further. And then their ships go into that false border, uh, saying, hey, we just put out a map, didn't you see we're allowed to go here? Um, it's much more alarming that everybody is up to it. If it was just the Russians doing it, we could deal with it. Because this is really a global trend, and the global trend has two roots, and then I'll finish, I've got 30 seconds. One of them is technological. Um, the information age is easily going to mutate into the disinformation age. The amount of tools to spread disinformation has increased so much, uh, we were very romantic about the arrival of the internet and many TV channels. We thought it would mean the arrival of truth. It's meant the opposite. It's meant the arrival of disinformation and just a tsunami of disinformation. Um, but the second one is philosophical, which is deeper. Um, I'll go via Joseph Brodsky. Joseph Brodsky, the Russian poet, talked about... Um, how the philosophies of the previous era become the political reality of the next one. So in the 19th century, communism, nationalism were political ideas. In the 20th century, they became political reality. In the 20th century, the key idea was postmodernism, that there is no such thing as reality, there is no such thing as truth, there is no such thing as fact, utter relativism, truth is unknowable, therefore why bother struggling for it? That was an interesting academic debate within the academy. Now this is becoming political reality. Um, uh, there's a very good Italian philosopher who talks about it, Ferraris, about how postmodernism has become the tool of populists. He's talking about Berlusconi, of course, but the Russians have completely realized this and are pushing it as much as they can. The ultimate message of Russia today is philosophical. Uh, it is there is no such thing as truth, is there is no difference between a professor from Cambridge University and a neo-Nazi who we say is an expert. That's what they do this all the time. They'll put some freak on and say, hey, he's an expert too. There's no difference between an expert and somebody we take from the street. If there is no such thing as objective truth, there is no such thing as uh, you know, a reality to fight for, I think this is actually going to be a very, very dangerous era as sort of philosophical postmodernity becomes political reality. The idea of any, especially in the context of globalization, the idea of any kind of global order relies on the idea that we can have an agreed upon reality that we can debate. If that reality is undermined, if everything is perpetual chaos, then we're not going to be able to br build instit international institutions within, with which to have uh, any kind of rational and reality-based politics. That sounds very grand. Um, I would be very careful when we talk about Russia today to give it too much credit. Um, I'll give you one anecdote and then I'll finish. When you do a story about Russia today, you get one phone call from them. They don't say anything about your criticism. They say, can you go back to your article and put in that we have 600 million viewers and that we have one billion hits on YouTube? Russia today, at the end of the day, in, in, in the English language, is an exercise to make Russia look bigger than it is. Of course they don't have 600 million viewers. Yeah, they have 600 million homes they can get to. The whole point of Russia today is Putin turning up you know, with a big cortege, you know, saying, hey, look at me, I've got oil companies, I've got a TV company. Do you really want to mess with me? Do you really want to impose sanctions when I have so much? So they are constantly trying to augment their relevance. And actually, uh, Vasily Gatov, a Russian media critic who's now in the US put it very well. The best reaction is just to ignore them. Can you, can you use the phones for the yeah. Yeah, so 18 minutes. Já děkuji Pítrovi za uh, výborné shrnutí. Já bych možná předtím, než začneme tu debatu, doplnil pár věcí v češtině. Doufám, že 
Peter bude rozumět. Já bych rád předeslal několik věcí, které cítím z celé té debaty. A to je to, velmi často mluvíme a používáme slovo boj s ruskou propagandou. Já bych rád sdělil, že já osobně necítím žádnou potřebu bojovat s ruskou propagandou a myslím si, že by to tady mělo zaznít v tom, že bychom o této věci měli být maximálně informováni, že bychom měli znát dobré informace, o což se snaží ten dokument a určitě se bude snažit tato debata, ale že bychom neměli s nikým bojovat, nechávat se vtáhnout do nějakých bojů, ale být obezřetní, být si vědomí rizik, které tato, cel, tento celý proces způsobuje a přináší a mět být schopni ubránit nějaký ten svobodný prostor. A řekl bych, že ten svobodný prostor je to, to druhé, velice důležité. My nechceme s nikým bojovat, my si jenom s, jsme velmi vědomi toho, že existuje síla, která velmi účinně a velmi cíleně vstupuje do jakékoliv otevřené, svobodné debaty, která se snaží být zasazená ve faktech, v konkrétní realitě, tak, aby ji znemožnila, aby co nejvíce lidí postavila proti sobě a já bych řekl, že se neustále bavíme o efektu Russia Today, který nás mate, který nám nedodává ty informace, který neustále jako vytrhává věci z kontextu, ale nebavíme se moc o efektu, který mají na čtvrt miliardu rusky mluvících lidí státní ruské televize, které skutečně jsou používány stejně jako Russia Today jako zbraně a které vy, aktivně vyvolávají maximální nenávist, propast mezi lidmi, při které už jakákoliv debata není možná, pokud vám neustále bude zdůrazňováno, že váš soused je vrah člověk, který znásilňuje děti, který, který mučí, který ne zabíjí, ale, ale který koná neu, neuvěřitelná zvěrstva, tak ve vás postupně vystoupá, vystoupají ty emoce tak, tak silně, že to vypne mozek a že už jakákoliv debata, cokoliv, co by hledalo kompromis, nějaké rozumné řešení, už není možné. A to je, to, tohle jsou vlastně dvě věci, které jsem chtěl předeslat pro tu naší debatu, že se nebavíme o něčem, že bych ruské straně nebo komukoli jinému, kdo používá stejné nástroje, upírali právo na prezentování svého názoru, nebo že bychom chtěli tento názor ignorovat. Já osobně dokonce si myslím, že Rusko má skutečně právo, legitimní právo vyjadřovat se k Ukrajině, že tam má spoustu legitimních politických, ekonomických, kulturních zájmů. Ale že největším problémem je, že namísto toho, aby je hájilo věcmi, které jsou ověřitelné, které jsou, které jsou zasazené do nějakého kontextu kultivované normální debaty, tak používá tyto zbraně, které de facto e, zamlžují tu realitu a které vlastně podlamují jak, jakoukoliv možnost nějaké normální diskuze. Jo. Tak to bych rád předeslal, nebudu dál mluvit a určitě především bychom měli dát prostor Pítrovi. Je čas na vaše dotazy, a vzhledem k tomu, co už bylo řečeno, bych vás rád poprosil, aby každý dotaz neměl více než jednu minutu a aby byl veden v maximálně neagresivním tónu. Pokud by se tak nedělo, tak s velkou lítostí budu muset ten dotaz zastavit. Myslím si, že jsme přišli kvůli kultivované a rozumné diskuzi. Pokud to tak nebude, tak bych ji nerad rozbíjel jedním člověkem. <laughs> tak, Kateřina, tady. Mikrofon. Dobrý den, Kateřina Šafaříková, novinářka. Já mám dotaz, který byl inspirovaný jednak tím, co řekl Pítra, jednak i tím, co si řekl ty Josefe. Týká se té vznikající buňky na půdě Evropské unie, konkrétně v rámci Evropské rady, té služby pro vnější akci. Tahle ta buňka má nějakým způsobem navrhnout, jakým způsobem, ne snad jestli bojovat, ale nějak čelit té ruské propagandě nebo ji zatlačovat zpátky, abych tak řekla do boudy. A moje otázka je, co by se mělo stát, aby výsledek práce zhruba roční této skupiny měl nějaký význam nebo, nebo smysl, aby to 
něčemu pomohlo a čemu vlastně. Já jsem velmi skeptická, že z centra řízená věc může navrhnout něco, co ovlivní potom chování každého jednotlivého novináře nebo případně každého jednotlivého čtenáře, politika v EU28 v Rusku. Ale klidně se nechám přesvědčit, takže by mě zajímalo, co by mělo být výsledkem této práce těch expertů, Britů, Čechů a tak dále i Rusů, aby to mělo význam. Děkuji. Okay, so there's uh, these big, well, which group, do you mean the group in the European External Action Service? The Mogherini group? Yeah. Well, what is the result of any action by the European External Action Service? <laughs> no, no, that's cruel. They do their best. But listen, God, I, I've met them and their main concern is the, well, this is much more about the EU than it is about Russia. You people are young. I was living in the Czech Republic. I just finished university and I was living here in 2001. I was here when 11 September happened. But it was the period of transition. It was the period of Aki Communitaire and joining the process of Czech the Czech Republic joining the EU. Back then, the image of the EU was that of a slightly benign, rich idiot. And there was something of the air hostess about it, you know. Join the EU, you know. Uh, exit is to the right, but on your it's very bland. And the, when you talk to people in the press department of the EU, they always knew that national governments would use them when anything went wrong. So the British do this all the time. George Osborne loves to do this. We have a problem with the economy. It's Brussels' fault. And the EU would just sit and take it because its soft power was so strong. Suddenly, the EU has got a narrative disaster. Uh, in Greece, it's one of the horsemen of the apocalypse. Uh, in Spain, it's hated. In Moldova and Ukraine, it's thought to be the harbinger of the bringer of sort of enforced sodomy. I mean, the EU suddenly finds itself in a world where it has to think uh, about its narrative. It never had to. Um, uh, I tend to think, I don't like this word narrative when political groups use it. I think the best thing they could do would be good policies, you know, and sort out the Eurozone and suddenly they'd be attractive again. Um, I, I, I don't know, when I hear politicians use the word narrative, I, I reach for my gun. Um, I, I don't believe in clashes of narrative and political levels. I just think you need better policies. Uh, they need a much better policy in Ukraine. Um, I actually thought the original one, the original Bill Tchaikovsky policy was quite good, but it, it collapsed under the weight of, of Russian pressure and Yanukovych's corruption, and the EU had no answer. They didn't know what to do. They just sat there going, but, but there's an association agreement to sign. I mean, they were passive. I mean, they were, the Russians like to say that the, you know, the EU were behind the Maidan, but, you know, we all know that all they could do was stand there shocked uh, as everything kind of collapsed. Um, I think, you know, there's, I wish them well, but I think it's so connected to policy, they need to create strong policies in the region. I've been working on a different project for the European Endowment for Democracy, which is a think tank, where we have been asked by the Dutch, British, and some other EU governments to come up with the solution to the really big problem, which isn't Russia today. It's Russian language propaganda for Russian speakers. So we were looking at what sort of alternative Russian media should be created for inside of Russia, but also for minor Russian minorities in the Baltics. Yeah, exactly. So that was an attempt to try to deal with that. So I think that's important, but that's really, you know, that's something where media can do a lot. Um, but yeah, um, I, I wish them well, I mean, but there's just so much for the EU to think about at the moment, outside of Russian propaganda. What is going on with Greece? Is it collapsed yet? I mean, what's, I don't know what's going on. Tomorrow, okay. Yeah. Já bych možná trošku zmírnil Pítrův velmi tvrdě euroskeptický pohled na celou věc. Já si myslím, že ta skupina může přinést určité věci, když nebude bojovat, ale když napomůže jakýmkoliv způsobem k vlastně nastínění toho, jako o co jde. Já bych řekl, že my v danou chvíli zápasíme s tím, že drtivá většina lidí nemá konkrétnější představu o tom, jak to celé funguje. Viděli jsme třeba 40-minutový výborně udělaný teď dokument, který se mi jako líbil, myslím, že byl vel, velmi dobré antré pro jakoukoliv diskuzi, ale kdyby v něm bylo 
dva, tři, čtyři konkrétnější příklady toho, že se něco dělo a jak to ty ruské televize zpracovaly, jak to obrátili, tak to může být ještě průkaznější. Jo. A myslím si, že tohle jsou věci, které eh, jako by se měly maximálně popsat, eh, maximálně srozumitelným jazykem. Je to mimochodem zajímavé, že my s tím zápasíme eh, velmi dlouho, ale přesvědčit někoho o tom, že to je závažné, se nám daří až v momentě, kdy se to bezprostředně dotkne nás. Jo. Typický příklad, dokument o, pseudodokument o srpnu 68 je něco, kdy už to každému dojde. Není možné mluvit o tom, že invaze trochu byla a trochu nebyla a abychom byli zůstali objektivní, tak ona vlastně ona vlastně někde mezi, jo? A ten názor, my nejsme schopni nalézt fakta k tomu, abychom řekli, že ona buď byla, nebo nebyla, a pokud bychom to řekli, eh, tak už nejsme objektivní, jo? A tohle jsou prostě všechno věci, které se vám neustále znovu a znovu opakují. Já dám jeden příklad za všechny. Eh, sám jsem byl během toho masakru eh, na Kijevském Majdanu eh, na té ulici, a vím, co to znamená pracovat pod tlakem, vím, co to znamená, když máte dvě, tři hodiny na to, abyste uprostřed takto obrovsky emotivní situace, kdy po vás střílejí lidé, kdy tam umírají lidé, kdy, kdy je odnášejí, abyste poodstoupili od celé té věci a podali nějakou srozumitelnou zprávu, na kterou máte třeba dvě hodiny. Mně v ten moment za plať pambu přiletěl kolega Jakub Santo, který, který najednou měl k tomu ještě další oči a tu realitu se nám nějakým způsobem v tom vymezeném čase podařilo prostě popsat. Jo. Ale to, co jsem viděl hned druhý den na Russia Today, byl jako vlastně úplný opak celé té věci. Vy něco popíšete a neustále se klepete, jestli jste něco nevynechali, jestli náhodou tam nechyběl nějaký střípek, který tedy postupně doplňujete, jestli jste ně v něčem podstatném, jako v rámci reportáže, která má maximálně dvě minuty, neuhnuli. Russia Today hned druhý den vysílala, že na tom, na tom Majdanu stříleli převle, převlečení ultranacionalisté a že celé je to součást americké, americké akce Gladio, což je v zásadě špionážní akce CIA. Jo. Jinak řečeno, jako naprosto pro jakoukoliv pozornost se prostě ne, jako nemazali se s tím. Že? A s tímhle vlastně my se jako setkáváme a myslím si, že kdokoliv, kdo, kdokoliv, kdo tomu pomůže, jakákoliv skupina, kdokoliv, bude to jedině dobře, byť samozřejmě sdílím částečný skepticismus, že to může vyři, vyřešit nějaká instituce. Tolik z mé strany. Prosím. Sekundu. I would just like to doubt the theory uh, that we have only to defend our liberty and not fight against propaganda. Actually, if I look a bit back, I'm an old man, so it may be permitted. In the 30s, the democracies didn't think that they have to, to fight the propaganda. There were two excellent propaganda there, which uh, was the one was Mr. Dr. Goebbels from Germany, and the other was done from Moscow. Both very effective totalitarian propaganda, which influenced the whole generation. Uh, only when the war started, suddenly, uh, in England and in the States, they realized they have to do something, and uh, made quite a good, a very soon uh, effective uh, counter-war against this propaganda, which then again, in the 50s, Against, against the Soviet propaganda, uh, the Congress for, for Cultural Liberty and in other institutions then involved. I do think in, if the um, propaganda war enters uh, uh, intensively, we have today, uh, you have to do something against it. And not only uh, defend your own liberty, but you have to fight against propaganda in this world, which is necessary, because let's be honest, um, uh, you say, you know that this is an error, but people who just look in the evening on the television are very much influenced of it, and if they listen only to one truth, that is disastrous. Thank you very much. But the, but what, what, what do you... 
Well, if we're talking about Russia, I mean, so what would you suggest? What, what do you think are the most effective countermeasures? What do you think are the most effective countermeasures? I think we have a, to still to develop a real strategy. But may I remind you, for instance, what was done in the 50s, uh, again, then the still very good, the very overwhelming uh, Soviet propaganda, which was a Congress for Child Liberty, very often fight, uh, using very influential intellectuals like Kerstler, Stephen Spender, and so on, who uh, themselves were in the younger years communists, knew the tricks and so on. And I think we have to do such a similar thing today. It is necessary because I do, uh, because we have to realize that the, Soviet, the Russian propaganda is not anymore, as it was uh, 20 years ago, uh, effective on the left, but very effective not only on the extreme right, but in normal conservative circles, where they de look uh, as Putin as a a defender of traditional uh, European values, of Christian values, values and so on. And that is a very dangerous attack because uh, therefore Putin, you see him always speaking with the patriarch, having a candle in hand, uh, speaking with some uh, archimandrit at the church and so on and so on. So we have there a really very effective propaganda. The, on the left, anyway, that is in the moon, more known uh, patterns, and we have to do something against it. Uh, liberty has to be defended, and in an offensive style too, sometimes. Děkujem, děkujem. Pojďme k dalším dotazům. Tamhle. Uh, good evening, Jiří Novák, Charles University. I have the very same question, Peter, that you asked, Mr. Schwarzenberg. So what is your solution? You are the expert here. We are, or at least I came to listen to your opinion about it. I have a number of jokes. You are very effective in answering your email. And isn't that the situation we are in? We want to tweet. We do not want to study long articles. We want to be entertained. We don't want to be informed. Isn't that actually a setting where the propaganda is very easy to do? And Russia today is just taking the opportunity to give people what they ask. And I also think it's very important to counter it, and I want to hear your opinion about how to do it. And you, you, can, you can skip the jokes if you want. Yeah, I mean, I've written several uh, large studies about what to do. I think the problem is this word counter-propaganda. Uh, it's very funny, on the EU project that we worked on, that was the word you're not allowed to use. Um, no, 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 if you listen to what I'm saying, what I'm saying is we have to, this is the greatest challenge of the 21st century. I mean, I'm biased because I work in media and information, but that's what I'm saying. Disinformation is the challenge of the 21st century. It's a philosophical challenge, not just a, uh, not just a sort of a PR challenge. So, so no, I think it's incredibly serious. Um, and it actually starts all the way from developing media literacy, because at the end of the day, the only way you can... You can have people withstand propaganda is by making them understand how they're being manipulated. So that's a long-term educational project. Uh, through to, if we're talking about Russia, uh, through to support uh, for Rus alternative Russian media, that's really where the fight is in Russia uh, and in the Russian-speaking places. So in the minorities in the Baltics, Moldova, Ukraine. But we did a very detailed analysis. And let's say, let's take Let's take Moldova as an example. The situation there is actually very different from Estonia. And the solutions that you have, that you need, are very, very different. So in Moldova, they just don't have any good television. It's not about Russian, Moldovan, Ukrainian. Basically, we made a huge mistake, I think, in 1991. We, I mean, the collective West, who I represent during this conversation. Um, uh, basically, we had this very crude idea that uh, for a lot of these countries, all they had to do was privatize some companies and they would become democracies and have the odd election. Uh, we we, what we should have done in retrospect is plowed a hell of a lot of money into supporting public broadcasting there, which was above any oligarchical influence. In Moldova, basically, every channel belongs to some oligarch who uses it purely for political tools 
All of them show non-stop Russian stuff because it fits their agenda or it's good entertainment. So they're completely within the Kremlin kind of bubble, plus all the news is non-stop disinformation. Not necessarily Russian disinformation. It can be one oligarch against another oligarch. So there is no space for public debate. And we thought that wasn't important. We had this kind of attitude towards journalism that it's kind of important, but not really. Uh, what Moldova really needs is a very strong public broadcaster, independent of any kind of vested interests. That's actually the most important thing they could do there. Once they have that, they can you know, defend themselves from various influences. This, this situation is totally different in Estonia, where they actually have quite good Estonian television for Estonians, but they have a Russian minority which uh, uh, is completely lives in a bubble created by Kremlin TV. There they have to create Russian language media for them, and it's a question of what kind they create, and we've just done a 500-page report about what kind. So every situation is different. I mean, the great difference between the Soviet Union and Russia is that the Soviet Union had a, a big ideology that you could counter. So it was, you know, in terms of narrative, it was uh, Larders, the Politburo, uh, and, uh, and, and the Red Army Choir versus the Beatles, BMWs, uh, and elections. I wonder who won that battle. But nowadays, they've done something very clever. They've basically torn apart the Western narrative. Yeah? They basically say, you can have your Beatles, you can have your BMWs, you can have Naomi Campbell, you can have stocks and shares, and hate the West, and love Putin, and hate democracy. So suddenly we're like, but oh, what do you, we have nothing to offer. And what they've become very good at here uh, in the West, or even in the sort of frontline states, is to just get involved in whatever the conversation is, yeah, and try to fan it. So in France, they're backing Jean-Marie Le Pen. Yeah, they've gone with the far right. In Greece, they've gone with the far left. In Britain, they've gone with the separatists. In Germany, they've gone with the financial elites. There is no one narrative to counter this with because they just find every weak spot and try to fan the flames. It's very hard to measure the impact because they're just going with the tide. So that means you'd have to look at concrete answers everywhere, but I think the big philosophical challenge is, is, is one about uh, defending the idea of information per se. Um, so yes, no, I think, I think we need massive investment. Uh, you know, I'm British, so I believe in public broadcasting, and I believe in the BBC. I think we need like a, a European-wide BBC. I think we've um, um, we had a very stupid attitude towards journalism, that it wasn't important. I think journalism is as important as nurses and pavements. So, I mean, we probably needed Obamacare for journalism. Journalism has collapsed as a model. This is, you know, the tragedy that's happening. So there is no one to defend from disinformation. It used to be journalism, but that's almost disappeared. So I think we need a completely new model for journalism to reboot it and recreate it. We might need a new profession uh, of mythbusters, facts, fact-checking. Remember that thing, fact-checking? doesn't exist anywhere apart from the New Yorker. Uh, fact-checking, I think, should be, uh, you know, socially... Uh, socially supported. It's a multiplicity of things. I mean, there is no one bullet solution. But also, as I said, a lot of the informational strategy that Russia has developed is, is really more in, less to do in the province of journalism, more in the province of secret services, police, and so on and so forth. I mean, they see it as a holistic approach which combines economics, business, uh, and media, and the idea that journalists could save us or intellectuals could save us—no, a lot of this has got to do with, you know, better intelligence services. So, it's 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 really a, uh, you know, a multifaceted challenge. Sorry, I'm checking my emails. My wife. I know that's very rude. That is very bad. You're quite right. The <coughs> problem is... of attention is very important. You're quite right. Slečna se ptala, že já jsem vás nepustil ještě ke slovu. Se, se, se. Um, English better, if English I may. Better. Uh, so my, I'm Salome Asatiani, I'm a Georgian journalist, I'm from Radio Liberty. First of all, I would like to thank you, Peter, for all the work you've been doing. It's been extremely important to all of us and to me personally. As for the question, I would like to go back to your idea about this postmodern paradigm that there is no truth and there are multiple truths and confusing people is extremely important without channeling one narrative. Um, that Russian media, Russia Today in particular, is um, pushing through, while at the same time it seems to me that domestically Russian nationalism, the kind of version of Russian new Russian-ness that mm. people like Putin himself, Russian patriarch, even 
Dugin have been perpetuating is precisely criticizing the, the so-called you know, postmodern era patriarch saying liberalism leads to um, apocalypses and family values being eroded and we need one truth, we need uh, simplicity, we need all real values. So can it be said that, that, that this is how Russia juxtaposes itself or distances itself from the West, it seems to me at least. So can we say that they is a conscious game, that they take advantage of this climate while at the same time criticizing it and building their own new identity on it? That's my one question and another little follow-up very briefly. Um, you, in the film, you said uh, something like the most, the, the, the Russian propaganda machine is taking advantage of this climate that um, a lot of people in the West are very critical of the Western history, Western narratives and are very open there is this openness towards accepting the views of the other. The other is good, you even said that phrase. So were you implying that left-inclined people are more susceptible to the Russian propaganda? Or, or how are we supposed to interpret that? Thank That's you. my question. So thank you. That's, those are really interesting questions. Actually, you know, coming back to humor, humor is actually our most important weapon against a lot of their propaganda. So I'm going to hang on to humor and making jokes, and uh, I'm going to hang on to the philosophical and ideological importance of humor as the key weapon. Um, oh, so such good questions. Uh, see, I'm, going to, I'm not going to quote Zizek and then criticize him. So, um, the, um, okay. Let's turn it into a story. 2011, yeah? Putin realizes, oh my God, there's hundreds of thousands of people on the street. Um, I need some way to rejig the narrative from, you know, there's this very strong slogan they had that Putin was part of the Partia Zhulikov and Varov. You know, this re the anti-corruption message that there is a corrupt elite ruling us, it had caught fire. Everyone was saying it. My in-laws, whose daughter I'm answering on email, um, uh, were, who were kind of quite loyal patriotic Russians, were like, yeah, Navalny, great, they're corrupt, they're bastards, they're ruling over us. So Putin and his spin doctors, the politechnology, the political technologists, are desperately looking for a new narrative. And then Pussy Riot come along. And Pussy Riot are God's gift to Putin. Because suddenly he can go, oh my God, this is why Navalny was so angry at them. Suddenly, Navalny can, suddenly Putin can go, it's got nothing to do with corruption. It's got to do with feminism and witches <laughs> against us, the orthodox people. Uh, and literally, suddenly, within five minutes, they put together, in a truly postmodern way, a pseudo-ideology, a pseudo-narrative. And they were pushing it like crazy. And that's when he does the anti-gay law. The point of the anti-gay law was to find a victim at home, but mainly to get the West to go, uh, oh my God, he hates gays. Therefore, he's anti-liberal. And Putin was like, yes, I am. I'm against the West. We completely fell into his game. We completely fell into their spin. That's utter, utter post-modernity. The biggest, uh, I think Lipovetsky wrote about this, the Russian literary critic, the biggest thing the postmodernists could do was to, was to claim that he's the conservative. You know, that's the ultimate kind of position you have, you know. Um, so this was suddenly, it was concocted in front of our eyes. Nobody went for it. Putin's ratings were still very low. It didn't really work. This whole Orthodox Russia, Orthodox Russia, 3% of Russians who say they're Orthodox go to church regularly. It's the most atheist country in Europe. I mean, it's such a joke. Uh, people might have little crosses, but divorce rates, abortion, all the things you associate with social conservatism, Russia is Sodom, basically. Uh, and if you've lived there, you will know it's a very hedonistic culture. Yeah? Yakunin, Putin's great hero, this is a Russian oligarch, very corrupt. I might get sued. Fuck him. Uh, uh, who goes around talking about Christian values. He's famous for turning up with his like, very young lovers at these places where he talks about Christian values. It's a complete perversity of any idea of conservatism. Um, so it didn't really work, though. Putin's ratings were still quite low. And remember the Maidan. The first thing they tried to do about the Maidan, gay Europa, Euro Sodom against conservative Russia. Didn't really work because there were priests on the Maidan. You know, you could tell there was a really strong religious thing on the Maidan, doing the Vichy, the Ochi Nashri, doing this 
prayers every night so much more powerful and genuinely religious than the corrupt patriarch in Moscow. So that didn't work. So they were like, okay, this narrative of Orthodox Russia against gay Europa doesn't work in Ukraine. So they switched it to fascists, which is an another old narrative. So look, they're switching narratives like, like a true postmodern artist. It's like, okay, we need a new movie. So suddenly it was fascists against Russia. That had more resonance because the fascism story goes very deep into, you know, the World War II legacy, Banderovtsi, that's very, very deep inside Russia. But then, very inconveniently, Pravy Sektor and Svoboda got less than 5% of elections. And Russians aren't that stupid, you know, they can tell, you know, the elections are not proving the fascist threat. So, finally, having gone through orthodoxy, having gone through anti-fascism, they found the one story that worked. It's a plot by CIA, Masons, Jews, la la la, the conspiracy. Russian TV, and here I will, I have very mixed feelings about Zizek, but I think he's very right about Eastern Europe, especially the idea of an official ideology. Official ideology is this bullshit Russian conservatism. The real ideology is what the discourse is. So the discourse in Russia on TV nonstop is conspiracy, conspiracy, conspiracy. Everyone's against us. The conspiracies can get quite baroque. So there was a lovely little viral video, which I really enjoyed, called Why America is Trying to Push Us Into War in Ukraine. And it was like, it was like a matroshka doll of conspiracies. Basically, the idea was that the people pushing Russia into war in Ukraine, as in the people around Putin, are actually CIA trying to push Russia into war in Ukraine so that Barack Obama could start a world war there to get people in America to forget about his problems. So if I'm a Russian person, sitting at home, drinking my beer, my brain starts to go into meltdown. Because I realize that everything I see, even the people around Putin are bloody CIA. You stop believing everything, you sit there, drink your beer, a little bit paranoid, a little bit passive, going, oh, it's all a conspiracy, you can't believe anything. Maybe even Putin's CIA, oh, I don't know. <laughs> so the discourse is completely postmodernist. It might be screaming orthodoxy, as the slogan, but the discourse is there is no such thing as reality. In that sense, it's not classic agitational propaganda. It's not Hitler propaganda, which is believe in an idea, go out and march, kill a bunch of people. It's not. It's much more passive making. It's about keeping you passive, paranoid, and kind of scared. And because you're scared, you want a strong hand. You want Putin to calm down and hug you. NTV, one of the main Russian channels, it doesn't show a positive picture of Russia. It shows non-stop rape, gangsters, pillage. You need a strong hand. Um, so I would say the discourse is deeply postmodern. They wouldn't call it postmodern. That's you know a word that gets thrown around. But in that idea that there is no such thing as truth, all bonds are broken, all trust is broken, all there is 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 sort of endless conspiracies. Conspiracy is what happens. Ivan Krastev puts this very well, the Bulgarian philosopher. Uh, conspiracy is what happens at the end of discourse. It's when discourse drops off. Uh, he also has a very nice line, if we go back to the far left, that you mentioned. Uh, Marxism is actually a huge conspiracy theory. Essentially, you know, there's an elite ruling over society. This is Krastev's idea, not, not mine, uh, which I thought was rather lovely. So there, maybe there's something implicitly conspiratorial in Marxism, talking about the left. Them the superclass ruling over us with their, you know. Pojďme k dalšímu dotazu. Pravá strana se zatím ulejvá, tak pojďme. No, I don't necessarily agree with that. Tamhle, tamhle pán v tričku, pravá strana. Už vám nesou mikrofon. Dobrý den, já bych se chtěl zeptat, nebo... Jestli byste nemohl říct něco o zbytku ruských médií? No. What was the question? <laughs> jestli byste mohl říct něco víc o, o zbytku ruských médií, protože zatím jsem mluvil hlavně o Russia Today, oh. ale jestli probíhá ta informační válka i uvnitř Ruska, nebo jestli je Rusko mediálně homogenní? No, 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 no. So, so I haven't been speaking mainly about Russia today. I've been mainly speaking when I was just answering the questions about domestic Russian media in Russian. So the TV is, is largely captured by the Kremlin and now gives this sort of line, of this sort of paranoid line. Um, overall, over the last 10 years, the Kremlin's aim has been to own all forms of narrative. 
said they would allow small liberal publications and small liberal radio stations. Um, and the idea was you'd allow them sort of to thus blow off steam. Um, they didn't want to force dissent underground, they wanted to keep it very contained. Um, one of the places I worked for when I was in Russia, and this is during the glorious heyday of the Medvedev Thor, uh, when Russia was going to be part of the Western whatever family, uh, there was a thing called Snob, Snob Media, created by Mikhail Prokhorov, the richest man in Russia. And it was like an incredibly well-funded um, ship of beautiful liberal media. We could say anything we wanted, as long as we didn't name bank accounts, and didn't do any real corruption research. We could shout at Putin, tell everyone how horrible he was, um, talk about a completely different type of lifestyle. We were trying to s develop the idea of a global Russian. So, you know, all this stuff. At the same time, we all understood there was no way Prokhorov would be allowed to do this project without the Kremlin's approval. So, kind of, we're only guessing of what the idea was, but it was almost as if he was creating a little bubble of liberalism, but which would be a priori hated by most Russians, because it's called snob. It keeps on talking about how rich all its readers are. Uh, you know, that was the advert. You know, this is the wealthiest, uh, you know, this is only for the elite kind of advertising. Uh, it talked about sort of holidays in the south of France, which would make most Russians hate it. Um, so it was the ideal thing for the Kremlin. It allowed the liberals at home. We could blow off steam. We felt we were listened to in some way. And yet it was, you know, Putin would go, I'm against the oligarchs. You know, I'm against the oligarchs and their, you know, liberal, uh, whatever, liberal elitist uh, uh, bourgeois. Uh, and sure enough, Mikhail Prokhorov then became the Kremlin sanctioned liberal candidate during the presidential elections. Got a very respectable 8 or 11 percent, maybe got more actually. Uh, and it was perfect. So, like, the liberals have been put in a place, allowed to feel that they mean something, and then Putin could go, Look, I'm against the oligarchs. I'm against this sort of like, you know, them and their elite vision. I'm a man of the people. So, you create your own opposition, give it a little space, not allowed on TV, of course, because that's important, but keep it there on websites, magazines in Moscow, and then you define yourself against it. So, it's, um, it's a much cleverer way of managing opposition. That's what it was called. It was called managed democracy. Um, uh, so, that's. Uh, but th things have got much worse. That was 2008. Now it's much harder if you're even a loyal liberal oppositionist. Life is very tough for you. Máme 10, uh, maximálně 15 minut. Uh, poslední tři dotazy. Tady, pán, tamhle. Děkuju, já jsem Pavel Šnýr, toho času nezaměstnaný právník. Mě by zajímalo, jak, jak, že by mě zajímalo, koho si myslí, že Putin označí jako za dalšího nepřátele, když tohle to přestane fungovat, protože každá propaganda prostě může fungovat nějakou dobu. Jestli to budou, u nás použil náš bývalý premiér Marťany, že, že když přijdou oni, tak bude hlasovat s nima, nebo to bude nějaký vnitřní nepřítel, nebo to budou, já nevím, ilumináti. Koho to tak jako vidíte? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So the, the inside one they've already chosen. So there's now. It's actually awful. I mean, you, you're right. Make jokes about it, but actually, sometimes we make jokes about it because it's so depressing. So last night, it must have been all on Sunday. Is today Monday or Tuesday? Monday. It, Monday. So last night, the latest Kisilov show. Kisilov is the the Goebbels of Russian TV. And it's that, it actually somebody sent to me last night. I don't know why I watched it. I can sleep half the night in a real like propagandist voice. There was videos about sort of American professors trying to do educational problems, programs in Russia, and the Russians who work with them. These are spies. These people have come here to disrupt our country. It is so bad you think it's a farce, but it's, you know, it's this sort of, you know, this horrible uh, mode. And listen, you have posters hanging up saying, this is our fifth column, and with pictures of journalists, uh, liberal activists, wannabe politicians, and Boris Nemtsov, always Boris Nemtsov, and eventually he was killed. Uh, so the idea of the fifth column, traders in our midst, is non-stop on TV, on posters, it's taught in universities, um, it makes McCarthy look like, you know, you know, a cuddly toy. Uh, it's, it's truly very disturbing, and it's, and it's meant to promote violence. Uh, so that's already happening. That's great. So gays, obviously. So uh, Russia is not homophobic in the way conservative, genuinely conservative societies are homophobic, as in marriage and stuff. But in the closest thing Russia has to an ideology is 
prison structure. That's something that survived from Soviet times to present times. And in the prison hierarchy, the passive homosexual is bottom. So you can use that, you know, uh, language. So it's awful being gay in Russia at the moment. It's truly awful. Not because people care about marriage and like, you know, holiness, but simply because they're the victims of society. You can't really do Jews, so I don't think they'll do Jews, simply because I don't think Putin's very anti-Semitic and it's just you just don't do Jews in the 21st century. Uh, you can't, they can't do racial stuff because that's setting off a whole thing because, you know, 30% of the population is Muslim. So you can't really do that. So what are they going to get onto next? Uh, albinos. Left-handers. Uh, it's going to get worse because it's it's now the mode in Russia. The movie in Russia is military. Um, traitors in our midst, so they're going to have to keep on looking for internal enemies, and they're going to have to look on, keep on moving, looking for external enemies. Um, so they can keep Ukraine going. I think they're going to do the. I'm guessing. I think they're going to do the Arctic. They're moving troops up there. It's already a big story. There's less blood, because I don't think Putin can afford very much blood, so there'll be a conquest. Uh, you know, they've already got Russian submarines diving to the bottom of the Arctic, planting flags, saying, this is our ice shelf, against the perfidious Danes and Canadians. So the Canadians, the Danes, will be the enemy. And uh, the Arctic is a nice battle, because there's not going to be much blood, maybe some dead penguins. Uh, it's a nice kind of movie about a war. You can do the narrative. And also, there's something to fight for. They're all competing for the Arctic because they think there's a hell of a lot of oil there. Uh, so I think the Arctic might be... It'll be the cold, 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 cold war. It'll be really cold. I hope it's the Arctic because that's bloodless. Um, ideally, I don't think Putin... I don't think... I don't think he cares about victims. I don't think he cares about blood. But it's sort of inconvenient. It's much better to have it in, in the Arctic. Ideally, he would just have a movie about a war. You know, like in Wag the Dog, without a real war. The whole thing with coffins, soldiers, mothers, it's actually kind of annoying. Um, so, watch out for the Arctic. It's a guess, but I've seen lots of little signs. They're, they're moving troops up there. There was a big story the other day. Tak, další dotaz, tady napravo. Um, very quick question. Um, is there anything that we can do in the West, broadly speaking, to support a free and independent press uh, in Russia? It's a very simple question, but there is a real history in the West of helping civil society structure itself. And basically my, condition is, are, uh, my, my question is, are the conditions in place on the ground to support uh, groups that do want to, uh, you know, propagate or at least send the right, a different type of messages than the messages that you find on, on NTV and, and Russia today. Thank you very much. Yeah, I mean, listen, a lot of this is technical. So there's now been a new law passed in Russia saying that foreigners can't be over 50% owners of any media. And that was partly aimed at sort of trying to squeeze that sector. So before the FT and the Wall Street Journal owned the majority stake in Vedomosti, which was an excellent business newspaper. Uh, and now they're being pushed out, so now the risk is they've been pushed out, the Kremlin can manipulate it better. Uh, you, you should really ask people like TV Doge, I know they're quite worried about taking foreign money, because you know, there'll be a tax for it. So it's really hard for them. Um, there's a lot of talk about, in the EU project I worked on, you know, the Euro project for some EU governments, uh, there was a lot of talk about whether we set up an, an alternative Russian TV channel, uh, but it would have to be based outside of Russia. I mean, the reality now is it would have to be based in Riga, Kiev, Berlin. Uh, and there's a lot of discussion about that. Uh, it's not happening at the moment uh, for various reasons. But look, there's very practical things you can do. So at the moment, this is getting really technical and really boring. Uh, this is more about how bureaucracies work. At the moment, the Danes give a little money. Cedar, the Swedes give a little money. Soros gives a, lot, a little bit of money, and it's all over the place. So one of the first things might be create like a, a board of donors, so they start to give money more strategically. So there's lots of, uh, I can send you, if you leave me your contacts, I'll send you the ED report, but very quickly are into very boring details of funding strategies and the sort of stuff that NGO people have to deal with, but the rest of you will probably very bored by it. Tak, poslední dotaz. Někdo vzadu? Ano, prosím. Hello, my name is uh, Matěj Bílý, so uh, all the debates uh, has been about uh, the Russian propaganda, so let me uh, ask uh, a very simple question. Uh, is there, according to your opinion, uh, something uh, 
which could be called a Western propaganda, for example, could you compare uh, Russia today with, let's say, Fox News? Thank you. Well, I, I did. Um, uh, um, I think the problem is this word propaganda. It's become, it's a bit like the word love. It means so many things, it's, it's almost meaningless. Um, what do we mean when we say propaganda? Do we mean public diplomacy? Do we mean, one definition of propaganda is Jacques Ellul's definition, any form of mass persuasion. Getting people to wear condoms, propaganda. An advert, propaganda. Um, so, I think we need to take this big word and start being much more specific. Obviously, Voice of America is propagating, you know, a, a positive image of America, but it doesn't do disinformation, or certainly not set up to do disinformation. Uh, you could say the BBC promotes British values. We have the Queen on the BBC a lot. I feel very sorry for people who watch it. Of course it's promoting Britishness, but part of that Britishness is not lying, you know, and so we rely on BBC News as a reliable source, even though it's clearly trying to promote and make Britain important. So that's all, you know, these are all legitimate activities. There's absolutely nothing wrong with the Russians having a, uh, as you mentioned, something which gives their opinion on Ukraine. That's, that's, you know, that's fine. So do you define it as public diplomacy? Then at the other scale, there's blatant disinformation campaigns, which is, I mean, I think RT is probably set up, to, well, not set up, but now seems to indulge in this. The difference between RT and Fox, the similarities, discursive techniques, so the use of conspiracy. Remember, who was that crazy guy on Fox? He's so crazy, Fox threw him off. Uh, Glenn Beck, yes. Very, I mean, similar to some of the stuff that, that so discursive techniques, similar. Uh, use of disinformation, also similar. I mean, Fox would tr often put out, they would have an expert on who would, for example, say, oh, Obama's got death panels in his healthcare reform and wait for the mainstream media to pick it up. That's what RT do. They'll do a blatant piece of disinformation, fascists taking over Ukraine, and wait for the other media to pick it up. That's the plan. It's called astroturfing in PR. So in that sense, yes, there are definite similarities. The dissimilarities. Fox is a private channel operating inside America where there is also CBS, NBC, and so on and so forth. RT is a state channel and it's meant to represent the Kremlin. It's part of the Kremlin strategy. In that sense, it's not acting on its own. It's also acting together with Gazprom, um, one of the largest armies in the world, etc., etc. It's part of that arsenal. So that, I think that's quite an obvious one. Second one, which is more interesting from a media point of view, we know what exactly what Fox is. Fox is crazy right, I mean, it's even crazy by Republican standards, crazy right wingers shouting for the Republican Party. I mean, you know exactly what it is. It never goes outside its audience. It's always that audience. Uh, it can't go outside. Actually, it's become a problem for the Republicans now because the Republicans are now tied to Fox and they can't win the middle. But you know exactly what it is and it's a guy standing on a soapbox screaming and Glenn Beck, whatever. Um, actually, some, you know, some Fox shows are quite good. Some RT shows are quite good as well. But that's, you know exactly what it is. RT is doing something very different. RT doesn't shout about Russia. RT will get into every narrative, the far left, the far right, the business narrative, and try to sort of like put itself in there and then spread out the little bit of disinformation it needs. So it's more like, imagine the head of Fox, Roger Ailes, actually owned The Guardian and was climbing inside left-wing discourse. So that's, I think, a crucial intellectual distinction. But in terms of the use of conspiracies, disinformation, and most, look, I'm with Obama when he says Fox is in a news channel. It's not. It's not. They're doing whatever you want, PR, black PR, that's what they're doing. It's not, in my European, very boring British understanding, a new channel. But the Americans have the First Amendment, and the First Amendment, I think, if we're really honest, is the right to, tell, to talk bullshit publicly. Uh, and also talk shit. But if you look at the history of the First Amendment, uh, that's what it is. I mean, there is a, you know, here we're into the First Amendment, what the Second Amendment also includes the right to carry arms and kill school children. I mean, it's, here we're into the strangeness of the American idea of freedom. Because you, when you mention the European or the British idea, we couldn't have Fox. We have a broadcasting authority which wouldn't let Fox exist. And which is being very hard on our teeth. It's 
doing a lot of fines against artists, telling them off, and there's a real conflict there. Uh, when you mention to the Americans that, like, hold on, Fox is the news, they're like, hey, but it's freedom of speech, and we really believe in it. And for Americans, they're, they're, they're David Remnick, the editor of the New Yorker, sort of said to me, I'm a free market fundamentalist. This is what America is like. We have Fox, anyone can say what they like, it is the right to scream lies. That's part of the American formula, which for a European is hard to understand, but, you know, ask, ask them, I, I, whatever. Um, já bych chtěl Pítrovi moc poděkovat za čas, který nám věnoval. Děkuji vám, že jste přišli, děkuji člověku v tísni, děkuji Filozofické fakultě, že nám uznila tady být a, a prosím vás o pozornost tomuto důležitému tématu. Hezký večer.